Good evening. Time is now 6.35. Uh, there's still quite a few people uh, logging on here. So we'll just be letting them in over the next, next few minutes or so. So first I'd like to thank everybody for joining us tonight. We have an exciting presentation and we're excited to have Carl speak about his experience working with Steve Jobs on the early Apple stores. Uh, but before I introduce Carl, uh, I'd just like to take a moment to acknowledge our 2021 chapter board. Uh, we spend a lot of time behind screens these days on the Zoom calls. So I would just like to recognize and thank our board for their hard work throughout the year. So next month, we have two in-person events for those that are, are from our region. So on Saturday, October 16th, we'll be doing a Bethlehem Steel History Tour. And then on Wednesday, October 20th, we'll be meeting at Lost Tavern Brewery in Hellertown, and we'll be having a Pints and Pumpkins event. So that'll be a pumpkin carving competition, and we'll get to have and try out some of Lost Tavern's beers. So that should be a good time. That's kind of geared towards young professionals, but all are welcome who are in this area and that like to attend. So if you have not seen already on, on that first slide, uh, if you like an AI certificate, please message your first and last name in the chat box directed to me as the host. Um, we do have your AIA numbers uh, that you provided during registration. So you don't need to provide your AIA numbers. This course is worth one AIA learning unit. So we'll make sure that you get that. Um, I'd like to now introduce Carl. So Carl, Back Carl Backus is a practicing architect with nearly 40 years of professional experience, having spent nearly his entire career with one firm, Bolin Swinsky Jackson. He joined the firm, then called Bolin Powell Larkin Swinsky in the fall of 1983 and worked on numerous higher education projects that helped the Pittsburgh office grow in size and recognition. His work for Pixar began in the early 1997 and after two and a half years of cross-country travel, Carl relocated to the San Francisco Bay Area. With the support of Pixar, he, with a team of 12, set up a temporary office to complete their drawings and to see the project through completion. After a year, and after securing additional work, some of, some of which was for Apple, the firm decided to make this Berkeley office their official fifth office. Over the years, with an expanding workload from Apple and other regional clients, several friends and colleagues from Pittsburgh joined Carl, most, not most notably Greg Matola and Steve Chetau. The present principals leading the Bay Area office. In 2006, they moved the office to its present location in San Francisco, overlooking Market Street. In addition to Pixar and Apple, Carl had the good fortune to work on a diverse range of educational, civic, and residential projects, some of which we'll see later on in his presentation. Carl left BCJ in the spring of last year and is the, in the process of establishing his own practice. He is a graduate of Georgia Tech and was invited back to, the, to be the School of Architecture 2011 Portman Prize Visiting Critic. In 2006, Carl was elevated to the College of Fellows of the AIA. So before I turn it over to Carl, um, if you have any questions throughout his presentation, uh, please message it in the chat box. And then after his presentation is done, we will read his questions aloud and then Carl will then answer for you. So without further ado, I'm now gonna turn it over to Carl. Well, good to be with all of you. And uh, many thanks to Jared and to the chapter board for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, great shame that we couldn't do this in person, but uh, glad we can certainly do this over a Zoom call. So uh, I look forward to sharing a few thoughts tonight. I um, also wanna thank your 
member of your chapter, Joe Biondo, for uh, contacting me some time ago and sort of initiating and encouraging me to um, think about this presentation. So thanks, Joe. Um, before I get too much further, I'll just point out that I've um, added the word iteration to my presentation. And I think uh, as you listen to the progress made through many of these projects, uh, how and how they each informed the next following project. Iteration is a very important part of uh, this narrative of working with Apple and in many regards, very important part of this general design. Um, before I get into the meat of the presentation, I have a few other acknowledgements to make. Um, certainly big hugs and thanks to Peter Bolin, friend and mentor, um, very much a huge influence on, on all of us that got a chance to work with him. As you can see, he became good friends with Steve Jobs. Um, alongside Steve is Ron Johnson, who was a colleague and friend leading all this retail development at the beginning, a brilliant mind in his own right. Uh, but it was very much uh, Peter and Steve's friendship that helped support um, this long-term working relationship. And certainly my story today is very much Peter's story. Also like to recognize uh, uh, John Jackson, who was principal in the Pittsburgh office and his leadership, both in terms of management and marketing was really an important part of the growth of the firm and a very important part of the migration to the West Coast, both in Seattle and the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, sadly, John, passed away a few years ago, but uh, very much a great mentor and motivator and uh, many of the leadership of BCJ today is in part due to John's leadership. Um, there are so many people that I wish I could thank, um, especially the San Francisco office. Uh, I don't have time to list all the names, but right, sure. uh, many of you, um, you are really much a part of my story. And so I thank you for that. Um, I've added this quote, which was an introduction to a lecture Peter gave in Dallas some time ago by Ed Baum, in which he noted um, the theme of curiosity and that curiosity, as he states, keeps us actively seeking, not just responding, and it welcomes change and challenge. And um, very much, I think, an ethos of uh, Steve Jobs himself and very much an ethos of the pursuit of doing this work both within BCJ and with Apple and Pixar and others. So um, hold on to that thought as I go through that you'll see that, the, that many of these designs were about remaining curious um, as they develop. As Jared pointed out, I started my career in Pittsburgh uh, in 83 and worked on several uh, higher end projects, these two for CMU and for University of Pittsburgh. And then was um, assigned and thankfully to be project manager for, from uh, the Pixar Animation Studios project and began this cross-country uh, travel and collaboration in, in early 97 that led to eventually, as Jer points out, to relocating. Uh, this transitioned right into a lot of work for Apple and, and as it stood later, uh, numerous other kinds of projects, including residential. Um, since leaving BCJ, I've been thankfully working on a project in Aspen for a friend and client and in the process of setting up my own uh, practice. Um, I've organized my talk into three segments, um, what I call before Apple Stores and Beyond. 
because I think it's kind of valuable to understand the trajectory of the, my career and especially of DCJ that led up to working on these Apple stores. In the early mid 90s, uh, Bo and Swinsky Jackson got numerous um, recognition, both as the AIA Firm Award publications, both in uh, initial monograph and in uh, national publications. And this recognition, I think, became uh, really valuable as the firm grew, started to do more marketing and started to get more uh, outreach. Um, so the first project really was Steve, um, even though we didn't, the firm didn't have much interaction with him, was for Next Computer, a regional sales office in Pittsburgh. Um, his leader of the time, Tom Carlisle, was a very good friend of his and um, eventually became the facilities director at Pixar. So as we leap later in the 90s, um, Tom was leading this charge to get a new headquarters for Pixar based here in Emeryville, which is a community just between Oakland and Berkeley. Uh, I should note that Pixar, when they started this uh, project had only completed one feature film. So they were still considered a, a startup company at the time. It's hard to imagine given their success since. Um, this is a project done with Peter Walker and Partners Landscape. Um, and it was very much an integral collaboration between the outdoor and the indoor. Um, and besides the amenities of a playing field and an amphitheater, the building was centrally organized around this great hall with two Eastern and Western wings. Um, the grid was established to kind of provide a hierarchy of arrangement of spaces uh, kind of woven with various boulevards or streets, create these neighborhoods and for communities for various work groups. Um, you can see we've created these little um, gathering spaces, which was referred to pods, so that they could have expansion space or, and or areas for, for collaboration. Um, throughout, much of this space um, was organized to allow for storyboard uh, movement and placement the distances between the doors were strategic to allow for a lot of exhibit of these storyboards so that teams could work and review um, progress of their dailies and other activities. As I said, it's sort of organized around this central space. Um, uh, Pixar was rarely interested in finding or inhabiting a, an industrial like building. So we created this immense structural frame, purposely left it exposed and created this volume that felt unifying and gathering for all the employees, which at the time of move-in was about uh, 600. Um, a very important part of this was for Steve was to get the building to have a tectonic and a level of craft so this steel assembly was bolted together um, using torque shear bolts. It was coated after speed blasting with a clear coat so it has a natural patina. Um, very much a unique feature of, um, of the project. Um, throughout, shared various models of assembly to get uh, consensus and approval of our concept for the structural frame. And it reveals itself right at the onset of, of coming in the front door, both as this large lofty frame and this uh, assembly of this uh, arcing bridge. Um, as you probably have heard, he was really fond of the idea of ch chance encounters. So the concept of a very broad staircase with a landing uh, to allow for people to get together as they traverse through the, the building. 
Um, all the amenities were centrally located around this great hall. The hall was purposely left fairly open to allow for a variety of activities and events that you know was very much uh, supporting the, the notion of a one company gathered on a single purpose of filmmaking. <clears throat> a lot of ancillary spaces right off to the sides of this great space to allow for uh, dining and, ca and casual interaction. Um, throughout, when we finished this project, we purposely um, left all the walls uh, white, knowing that Pixar themselves had a culture of sort of inhabiting their environment and allowing for teams and individuals to personalize this space with a variety of work products and even things to make their space um, quite comfortable. I would point out that Steve was very much uh, proponent of having so many of our employees have a private space because he thought their work was so demanding that they needed, you know, an opportunity to have solitude. Now, since then, they've, you know, allowed for, you know, gathering of more kinds of open environments. But this personalization um, was very much supported, um, both in terms of changing our light fixture, painting walls, or creating your own unique entry to your office. Transition to Apple stores. So we finished uh, Pixar in uh, the end of 2000. During that time frame, the early days, you can see that Steve was invited back to uh, help lead Apple. And within a short period of time, you know, led groups to generate some, you know, remarkable new products. Um, Peter and others were sort of involved with them in the early days of the retail store. I invited all of you to seek out this interesting little YouTube video of Steve showing off the very first stores, which were in uh, uh, the Los Angeles and uh, Baltimore, Washington, D.C. area, two stores that opened in um, Oh, sort of early summer of 2001. And it's really incredible to watch Steve's enthusiasm as he takes you through the store. So I encourage you at your leisure to find this YouTube video and look at it. Um, giving you a sense of the trajectory of his products and how it relates to these Apple stores. So the first store that I got to work on was considered the first flagship store, which opened here in 2000, which was a store in Soho. And it very much set the trend for how the stores would evolve and progress um, for many, many years uh, to come. Uh, Apple and Steve were very enamored with this beautiful neoclassical post office. Uh, it had been partially vacated by the Postal Service and was um, a retail store when they found it. And so we had to acknowledge a little bit of the postal activity and arranging the space, but it was very much similar to the very original stores of a very axial design that um, featured this uh, staircase, this open light well surrounded by a glass balustrade and a glass bridge and a skylight. And I should point out at the time, you know, this, the impact of this store to the shopping district of Soho was quite significant and uh, helped sort of rejuvenate an area that was um, on the edge of uh, just sort of not advancing as strongly as people thought. Um, as I pointed out, it mentioned a uh, number of glass features and a language of new materials different from the 2001. So the stores started to introduce the stone floors, uh, these wood 
Parsons like tables, which were sort of reminiscent of the actual tables designed for the ID studio at Apple campus. And it was very much leading you up to this presentation theater at the top. Um, at its opening, this store got a lot of press, both for its unique use of glass and how it sort of um, made a reference to Bauhaus design and how uh, it was just becoming a, a magnet for gathering. Also note that many retail experts um, believe that the layout and organization based on these concepts of solution zones provided an environment that was very inviting and very informative and helped uh, sort of generate uh, enthusiasm um, for the Apple products. Probably most notable was Genius Bar, in this case loaded, located on the second floor, um, and along with the theater and some other ancillary spaces. Um, important part of this was to allow visibility across the store. And so not only is it a magnificent material for its trans, uh, luminosity, but the transparency of glass helped uh, allow for this sort of view across and um, provided this sort of ambiance or effect of, you know, a great deal of reflected and attractive light that just gave this space um, an increased kind of luminosity. Um, concurrent with this, we were looking at materials like stainless, bead blasted stainless steel, which was sort of shaping this opening and the reflective quality of that added to this sort of glowing effect of being inside this um, room of light. Um, as you'll see later, um, the tectonics of designing and detailing this um, staircase was quite rigorous. Um, had some magnificent partners, uh, James O'Callaghan, company Sealy out of Germany, Tripyramid from uh, Boston all helped in doing this uh, design effort. Um, a rigorous uh, assembly and uh, layout of um, parts. Concurrently to that uh, store in Los Angeles that just opened a few weeks after, um, there started to build upon the use of stainless. This particular store had the unique feature of a stair being suspended from its second floor. So it had very tall sheets of glass, almost 20 feet. So at the time, the explorations of glass fabrication were expanded. Uh, this concept of the axial stair and, and uh, two, two story volume of space uh, continued through a number of stores, including here in San Francisco. Uh, first entree to international work in uh, Tokyo, um, a unique uh, recladding of this 1960s office building, uh, which we, in a sense, kept the structural concrete frame and reskinned it with uh, stainless steel panels and um, an open cavity glass wall. Uh, the value of this is we got to learn how to suspend or place glass sheets with the unique use of these fittings. And that sort of led into um, uh, how we would eventually use similar kinds of technology for the Apple store in New York. We also kind of looked at the idea of um, how uh, elevators, transparent elevators could enhance the sense of traversing through the space. This particular store was a three-story store, uh, too small to allow for a very dedicated stair. So the elevators became the means of uh, traversing vertically. Concurrent to all that, looking at how to make assemblies using curved glass. So technology and iteration advanced and um, these particular stairs were hung from the ceiling 
and you can imagine the uh, uh, engineering required to not only uh, make them stand up, but to uh, uh, endure the numerous customers that traverse Berkeley. All that led to probably the most notable store, um, Fifth Avenue in 2006. And it's hard to imagine at that time when it opened, that's uh, pre-iPhone, pre-iPad. Um, you can see Apple's trajectory of its stock was climbing. Um, uh, probably the most uh, rewarding of all the projects it's done for Apple, um, but it sort of synthesized a lot of this technological advancement and spirit of um, using glass as a unique feature. Um, it made a big impact to this part of uh, Fifth Avenue, which was at the time not considered a very good retail location. It's sort of too far north. Um, but as um, Eva Louise Huxtable pointed out, it you know, brought a big um, impact to uh, not only to this part of Fifth Avenue, but to the character and usability of the plaza. Um, by its size, it's very diminutive to the tower the behind, um, very much a beacon or a marker of a entry. And you come in and you descend down the staircase into uh, a large retail area. Um, at the time, it was the very, it was the largest of all the stores, considerably larger. And, um, dedicated to be open 24-7. Uh, but the nature of craft, obviously, in this staircase, very much paramount as we started to integrate, you know, a circular stair wrapping around a glass cylinder that supported the elevator. As I said, it was a very expansive interior, great amount of product on display, largest, service and genius bars in the company's portfolio of stores. Uh, the first use of stainless steel panels as part of the display system and backlit um, graphics. Um, probably on its uh, lighter day, but usually if you attended this store during this time, it was usually very packed. I used to always tell visitors to walk down the staircase and then ride the elevator up. It was sort of a magical experience as you kind of ascend from this uh, below plaza room and gradually see the city of New York uh, reemerge as you get back to the plaza level. Steve himself uh, was quite involved and interested in how these all developed at the onset. We would meet with them weekly as uh, he got more and more involved um, with product development. Those meetings became monthly and eventually went to quarterly. But this particular project he was quite uh, interested in. You can see me sort of patiently waiting for his uh, acknowledgement. That <laughs> we got it right. I ended up showing him numerous uh, examples of these fitting facings, um, trying to perfect the quality of polish. Um, and so you can see him sort of checking it out. Here's Ron Johnson with them over his shoulder. And his final result at night. So it had this uh, sort of beautiful kind of luminosity and reflectivity of the, the fittings. Um, so how did we get this done? Um, colleagues of mine um, helped put together this presentation that we you know, would make to various groups, especially um, uh, schools of architecture to describe how we actually crafted these assemblies of glass, uh, the staircases, um, the, the engineering that went behind it led by um, Eckersley O'Callaghan and Seeley, 
a lot of testing and a lot of understanding of how to sort of fabricate and deliver these materials. Um, it was so important to have this collaboration um, throughout all this process. process. Um, the glass required metal fittings that hold it in place. And so that um, integration, you know, was very much uh, an integral part of developing each and every of these stairs. I mean, Dwight Pyramid was quite involved in this. So as I pointed out, it was a great um, international team to do these. Uh, much to the chagrin of James, uh, the store teams often like to have group pictures on these stairs. So you can see it's really being tested uh, even well below its uh, limits. <laughs> so um, they are quite safe and they were quite uh, uh, perceived as quite fragile. Uh, going uh, a little further, city of Boston, after seeing what New York um, was able to pull off, was quite interested in having a store of their own. This is in the uh, Back Bay portion of Boston. It just so happened to be right outside the historic uh, envelope. So we were able to uh, thankfully get this uh, contemporary design uh, approved by the city officials. Uh, much of the language sort of got modified to attempt to simulate the rhythm of the adjacent facade, but it was first time to take a lot of our glass technologies, um, both in sort of hanging this facade and developing um, a three level staircase ascending up the center. Um, much like Fifth Avenue, but without its uh, elevator. So there was a lot of parts to keep this assembly. It's a gravity um, loaded staircase leading up to a very expansive display and service area up on the third level. Uh, concurrent to that, um, embarking on a project in uh, Australia, a, uh, thankfully the building owner was kind of interested in transforming what was this original lobby of this tower and to offer this unique space um, to Apple to create this three-level store. Pretty much a glass latrine right on the face that um, you know, used even greater amounts of uh, heights of sheets of glass, um, close to almost uh, 45 feet in height. Interesting enough, tucked behind um, this sort of luminous uh, two-story glass staircase. Now we're running to the end of my chart. You note that we're at uh, just before 2010. And um, at the time, after doing all these sort of unique um, stores of glass and um, stainless steel, there was an inspiration for Steve to create a grand room that had more sort of quieter presence and the idea of um, introducing stone to the wall assemblies. This is um, Tennessee marble stone, very much um, used throughout the country, numerous buildings in San Francisco, the National Gallery of Art, both the original museum and IMPA's um, edition or expansion use this same material. Um, beautiful stone, sort of carefully honed and crafted. But as I said, it was a it was a, a venture into creating a great room for product display. This was all product display. Um, all the services were down below and um, this luminous ceiling, thankfully, given the uh, adjacency of a lot of the taller buildings around, 
it only periodically was uh, filled with actual direct light. So most of the time it was indirect light and left the space with sort of calm and quiet uh, feel. Um, overlooking or embracing the city was very much part of this sort of grand, grand room. Utilizing much of the technologies developed by the previous stores to, again, create these very tall sheets of glass held in place by the fittings. Um, calm, quiet of, of the stone and its placement on Broadway, just up from Lincoln Center. Going again internationally, um, city of Shanghai and its uh, unique tower and uh, pedestrian circulation ring just in the foreground. Um, at opening day, uh, stores attract large amounts of crowds. And uh, this particular instance got to shape the ring that surrounds this uh, um, cylinder. Very much like Fifth Avenue, you know, you approach this lantern like object and um, descended down to this immersive uh, below plaza retail space. Materials continue stainless steel walls, gray limestone floors, um, taut fabric ceilings. In this case, uh, elevator was positioned remotely to let the center of it open to view upward. Other stores started to emerge in, in uh, Asia. Uh, as Unique bridge location in Hong Kong, again, um, allowing the glass to sort of fill the room and deflect off materials. So um, after all that, uh, in his true nature of wanting to always think about what's next and how to improve. Steve asked, you know, how would we build the cube if we rebuild it? So this particular one that opened in 2006, you can see it was three units high by six wide. So each sheet of glass was roughly five and a half by 11 creating a 32 to 33 foot cube. So after all that um, research and development, we return uh, in about a week after that question with this Photoshop modification, um, which reduced the number of glass from each facade from a total of 18 to three vertical sheets. Uh, and upon seeing this, Steve just said, we got to do it. Uh, here it is in its completion. Um, you know, much less fittings, larger sheets of glass. And uh, thankfully, um, when Foster and Partners redid the store, they rebuilt this cube in its original or the second iteration. I just make a note here as we're sort of celebrating anniversaries that um, Steve never got to see this to its completion. He had passed away just a few months prior to the completion of this cube. So we're soon approaching the 10th anniversary of his death. 
um, great uh, individual to work for. Um, I had a very pleasant working relationship with him and truly a, an inspiration. Um, <clears throat> but uh, we continued on, forgive the absence of the title. This is um, a collection of, of different stores. Um, as you can imagine, doing a lot of uh, stores in Europe and sent very important parts of retail areas meant that you deal with historic fabric. So while we were doing all this work in glass and contemporary designs, we also got an opportunity to think about um, historic restoration, recreation, and preservation. <clears throat> so this is one of the earliest. This one's just nearby the um, historic opera house in Paris. So a lot of this, as I said, was a blend of um, preservation and recreation and restoration. So same rigor of understanding how to detail, especially in doing all the special iron work for the balustrade. There's very much a, a continuing ethos of, of, you know, taking each situation, remain curious and objective and open to how to create something that has a particular resonance and appropriateness for its place. Um, London, um, uh, Regent style uh, facade allowed for a very unique um, design interior. It had a blend of uh, interventions throughout its life. And so the approach here was to very much acknowledge that and to sort of inhabit this uh, brick interior. Uh, got the opportunity to use the, this open well or atrium space and create a very uh, light, very different, but again, light filled uh, environment for interaction and, and product um, viewing. Still embarking on use of glass in two different staircases, glass cylinder, and then this unique one that sort of fit within another uh, light well to provide um, access over three levels. Uh, kind of a uh, unique interaction of the rough old technology meeting the new contemporary and uh, modern, modern use of glass. More of these extor, extor, stores, um, Barcelona took a slightly different approach of uh, more of a clean sort of um, modern aesthetic inserted into this uh, language of a historic, a more modern style of historic building. Uh, a lot of uh, reference to the store in uh, Upper West Side both in terms of the use of stone and, and uh, glass. Uh, leading on to Madrid, um, a very unique uh, stone uh, building facing onto one of its most notable plazas in the center part of Madrid. So you got a opportunity to create this uh, entryway with um, facing onto this plaza and allowing people to kind of come in and come in and flow through the store as they um, do, uh, traverse the area. The language of this store was quite uh, unique. A number of these um, uh, cast iron columns were kept, modified, and even recreated to create the language of a, of a, a unique sort of steel frame. I think you can see some parallels to what we had done at Pixar. Another 
um, grand atrium light. Similar use of materials there to reach a serena floor and um, marble walls. Um, as I said, like done it elsewhere, the rigor of recreation or refabrication, both in um, this iron work and uh, steel balustrade uh, is sort of rent following along the, the rigorous ethos. Closer to home uh, or close back to the US, um, came across uh, this unique location on uh, Madison Avenue in New York, a notable um, bank building from the 1920s that had unfortunately seen a lot of um, modifications to its interior. So what you see on the right uh, was its original condition. Unfortunately, a lot of that was lost. Um, so we got an opportunity to you know, restore the facade and for the most part, recreate an interior much like the historic Langley's. So a lot of these components were rebuilt. We had to refabricate the chandeliers and rebuild a lot of the coffered ceiling. Uh, created quite a, uh, in its own right, quite a beautiful room. Again, luminous with its, its tall uh, windows. Uh, just shortly thereafter, a uh, total recreation. Uh, this building did not exist, but um, the developer was quite interested in having a masonry building, and Apple went for it uh, to, you know, do a lot of the detailing, much um, the sense of craft uh, through masonry arches, uh, through a brick um, exterior and interior. Um, and again, you can see the language of this is very much reminiscent of uh, Pixar. This particular time, um, the display system started to evolve from um, the stainless steel individual um, units to kind of what was referred to as an avenue of uh, display. Um, built out of, um, at this time, white oak. Yeah. And a very, I think a very engaging room. And I think uh, in its own language, quite um, consistent with the rigor and ethos of uh, craft and uh, quality. Uh, in lieu of a dedicated theater, the company started to create what they called as open forums. Again, this is for education and for uh, uh, gatherings of different uh, natures, mo mostly for, um, uh, as I said, for educational involvement with uh, speakers and lecturers. Uh, next grouping, um, a series of um, pavilion stores and the unique aspect of these was after so many years of sort of inward focused um, arrangement of these stores, the opportunity to create things that were or environments that were very much outward reaching and engaging even more so with the, the surrounding plaza area. So this one for uh, Palo Alto and Stanford shopping area was a concept of two rooms. First room being for display and the second room um, for uh, education and service. And so the use of glass as an opportunity to create two different kinds of environments, uh, very rigorously organized amongst the display and service and a grand presentation to the South Door Plaza. You will see 
a uh, lot of use of glass in a highly seismic zone. So it is um, uh, safe <laughs> and uh, very rigorously engineered by our friends at Exterior Thalamium. So you can see this, this, these glass fins are actually supporting not only the facade, but helping support this uh, cantilevered roof. Customer support and um, education and product, additional product display in the back room. You know, as we were developing these, we were mindful of sustainability issues. Um, very uh, select use of glass for the back room, radiance systems for cooling and heating. And uh, this very much was integral to the continuation of these, uh, what I called pavilion stores. Tennessee being marble continues, Peter Serena, limestone floors, and the Parsons like tables for product display. Clean integration of materials, rigorous alignment of systems. Um, leaping to Japan, a very similar kind of um, store, but in this case, two rooms vertically oriented. Um, at the time, the, the uh, laptop, the Apple Air, and its sort of shape was uh, being referenced as we created the stainless steel um, curving arc slanting roof. Um, I will point out that this particular store, um, again, in a high seismic zone, um, much like we did at Pixar, um, was base isolated. So this, this uh, design would not have worked uh, without creating these um, separation of the, the actual building itself from its surrounding and allowing it to move uh, in on a seismic event. Um, this uh, grand presentation room facing on to this uh, notable shopping street in Tokyo called the Marasondo. Um, an opportunity to explore a slightly different stair, in this case, an arcing stainless steel stringers with, with um, steel supporting uh, the glass tread. Very engaging for public and customers as they traverse along the side of the street. Uh, interesting enough, um, uh, the city of Aix-en-Provence in France had this uh, desire to rebuild and relocate their uh, visitor center to their city. Very beautiful city. I encourage any one of you to go visit this location and uh, city. It's wonderful. But as a result of this relocation um, of their uh, tourist center, this uh, idea of rebuilding a pavilion-like structure in its place by Apple was, became uh, an opportunity to really um, continue this language of these pavilion stores. Um, in this case, it is primarily a single room, um, but uh, facing on to, again, the uh, magical boulevard in uh, Fountain of Aix-en-Provence. The uh, citizens really in, in, um, enjoyed this store. And so uh, even after it's closed, they uh, use its uh, floor space for um, a unique uh, celebration party event. Um, 
the last in this sort of sequence of probably uh, the greatest expanse of uh, face street facing store in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, again, primarily a single room, roughly about 160 feet of glass facade uh, facing onto again major uh, retail street. You know, by this time, some a lot of the um, lighting design have it evolved, and so got to these um, linear troughs with downlights in lieu of uh, sort of luminous panels, and I think it created a sort of calmer um, environment in the night, uh, quite glowing. So the last store um, got to work on uh, was not too far from uh, where I live, uh, just east of uh, Emeryville, Berkeley, town of Walnut Creek. Um, this was um, after Foster and Partners had uh, become more involved in the retail program. You know, they were invited to work on the main campus and some of that language that they were developing for Apple Park um, started to become important to integrate into um, the language of the store. So you'll see transition from different flooring material. We're not using a, a beige or light white. Um, terrazzo, uh, slightly different whitish stone, this one from Spain, and you know, an all wood ceiling. Strategy of the avenues as part of the language of the product display. And in this case, the forum boxes are all gathered together as clusters. And when uh, available as it is here, um, create uh, again, a different kind of uh, indoor outdoor experience of the retail. So it's offering up a connection of uh, the surrounding areas um, with this uh, seating area. Uh, I would just note there was an interesting and a very complimentary article uh, written, written by uh, Pilar Valadas. Um, and uh, this is uh, in a magazine called uh, Curb. And I only have excerpts of this, but um, she was very kind to um, write this article and to, to talk about how our 15, 17 years of engagement with Apple um, is really um, integrated with the brand. And, um, and at the time, even went so far to call it uh, its golden age. Uh, I would admit that this was um, only in the early days of uh, Foster and Partners uh, work on the stores. Uh, I would say they have really done a uh, remarkable transition to create some really incredible destination stores. So much to their credit of uh, continuing all this uh, effort that was leading up to this. Um, and most recently, you know, just some amazing stores in Asia um, that uh, only a company like uh, Apple could achieve. Uh, Eckersley O'Callaghan, who I mentioned, was a very integral part of um, all of this, and they, they themselves have expanded 
uh, be well beyond London and well beyond Apple to do you know, a range of very interesting and very challenging glass assemblies. So, so I kudos to uh, James and his team for being a partner of this. And um, I'll sort of conclude here um, with uh, what I call beyond, which is thinking about how these stores um, really were sort of influential in the trajectory of my own career and, um, and to some degree influencing um, how BCJ evolved. So, um, you know, number of uh, members of BCJ led by Greg Matola, and, you, know, you know, got an opportunity to work on numerous apples, uh, excuse me, blue bottle cafes. Um, another client that has a similar kind of ethos of simple and elegant um, environments. So I, you know, kudos to those teams for you know, you know, doing um, very successful and very clean um, environments, uh, even into with clothing companies of Everlane and Reformation. So, uh, more recently, this group, and interesting enough for reference to Tiana Mobile Retail Store, this is just a marvelous little intervention of creating something that has um, an opportunity for relocation. Uh, and you can see it's a, just a beautiful integration of uh, wood and luminous material. So um, I commend these teams for uh, continuing the sort of efforts in retail in the BCJ world. So my own career, um, thankfully I had an opportunity to work on other things than Apple stores. Um, so a project um, roughly 10, 12 years ago, the UC Santa Cruz that did with Steve Chato started to look at technology of creating immersive environments. This is a project we really won through our efforts at Pixar and even to some degree um, things that uh, were emerging part of our involvement with Apple. So the sequence of projects, I think um, both uh, working with uh, Steve on Pixar and Apple were very influential, influential and on our ability to uh, win these commissions. So um, two projects at UC Davis, first one done with uh, Sewell out of Brooklyn, uh, museum structure that had a lot of language of, of glass assemblies integrated with um, tilt up concrete panels. Uh, it was an interesting collaboration with Florian Eidenberg, who was a uh, project architect at the um, uh, Toledo Museum of Glass when he was with Sana. So, this language of using glass was very much um, a part of this um, museum design, rigorous uh, layout of systems and lighting. Uh, second project for UC Davis, again, trying to think about ways of creating a, uh, a location that brought people together from traversing the various paths of campus and roadways. Um, a uh, different kind of pavilion-like uh, location, but I think the language of creating these transparent um, spaces to allow for um, this connection of indoor-outdoor um, is quite important. Um, again, this campus um, really thought that we had our um, knowledge on technology, both in terms of assemblies, but also technology for display. And so you can see this space using these broad expanses of projection screens. Uh, the view on the left is daylit. 
So the use of light to create a very luminous space uh, was you know, very important to the success for creating a teaching environment for uh, 580 students. Uh, its influence, I want to end here with uh, two stores, I mean, two projects um, that are sort of the conclusion of my time with BCJ. Uh, interesting enough, um, the thread of Apple continues um, in terms of uh, influence and our ability to win and secure these projects. Um, so this is a a uh, new library for the city of Pleasant Hill, just north of uh, Walnut Creek. Um, Grand Hall kind of library, uh, embracing um, you know, areas for kids and for, for um, reading uh, interaction. But again, a luminous ceiling, expressed uh, steel frame, uh, much, you know, can see parallels both with the language of the Apple stores and with uh, Pixar. Uh, last project again with Steve and, and Christopher Sega in San Francisco, um, largely influenced in our build, with our work from Pixar to get this. Um, both of these projects are nearing completion and I you know, sort of look forward to seeing their final results. Um, but it's a large facility, a new film school, uh, which also had its own um, creative immersive space um, for uh, digital projection and um, you know, visitor uh, immersion. And its interaction with the exterior spaces to the south. So I kind of briskly went through all that, you know, I, as I um, told friends that um, I was going to do this presentation, they just sort of questioned whether or not I would be able to do it in less than four hours. and. Uh, so uh, I want to thank you for letting me do this in a sort of brisk overview. <laughs> I've uh, sort of introduced a lot of um, threads of both iteration, innovation, and influence. Um, again, uh, this is uh, uh, opportunity for me to just ask all of us to remain very curious architects explore various options and to uh, think different. You can see them. Thanks, Carl. So I do have a few questions that came through here. Yep. Are you for questions? Sure. The first one I have here is, what was the most number of Apple stores you were working on at one time? Uh, well, um, one of the uh, challenges of um, that we had working with Apple, there was a, a period of time when we have to, um, it was a, you know, unique situation where they kept asking us about our capacity. And <clears throat> Uh, there was a concern both firm wide and locally in San Francisco that um, the, the concern that I shared with uh, Greg Matola and Steve about how large of an office did we want and what was the percentage of stores that we could handle and what was the team size. So we arbitrarily said we never wanted half more than half the office to be working on stores. We wanted a great diversity. Um, and, you know, not only for our own 
health, but our own uh, ability to provide diverse work experiences for the employees. Because doing these Apple stores um, got to be quite repetitive and people often wanted to change. So at one point, <clears throat> um, you know, we sort of divided up the world into three areas, North the Americas, uh, UK and the EU, and then Asia Pacific, and sort of decided on which areas uh, and which stores in each area that we would focus on. So I would say at, at one point, we might have had anywhere from eight to 12 stores at one time. Um, there were a number of stores that we did just on a conceptual basis. We just provided early layouts and sort of concept design, and then it was executed by others. And then some we you know, took all the way through. Of course, the international work we were doing with a lot of local uh, architects. And so, you know, the collaboration with them were, you know, quite uh, important to maintain this sort of pace. Um, so I think at the probably at its um, busiest time, I think the office was close to 62 or more, and we had roughly 30 people just on stores. And uh, uh, it was a it was a tough thing for us to manage. So. Thanks. So I, I do have a few more questions here. Um, if you would like to ask Carl a question, uh, please message it in the chat box, whether it's to me as the host or to everyone, it uh, doesn't matter, we will get to it. So Carl, next question. This is one uh, pertaining to the Fifth Avenue Apple Store. So can you explain the Apple Jobs logic of defying retail design and not seeing the product from the street? Uh, well, yes, a pretty um, bold move to do. Um, so um, when it was first, um, offered to Apple this particular site on Fifth Avenue and the, and the uh, developer owner of the GM building, Harry Macklow had this idea that if you created a bold enough entry, it would be a magnet for people to come. And he was thinking of a variety of things and you can see from that, um, sketch that um, Peter and I worked on that um, there was a lot of exploration of what the, that shape would be. Um, so it was a sort of a bold and daring move to think that you could create a object that would just draw people to it. And of course, repurposing the plaza making it much more accessible was integral to that. And learning um, that there is actually something of interest down below, <laughs> um, uh, just uh, created a sense of like a mystery or a way, I, you know, I gotta go see this, what's happening here? And so um, it relied on, uh, as again, this kind of, mystery and word of mouth of people spreading that you got to go see this. Um, to some degree, the even though there was some product display in the windows at Soho, the signage was just a small little cutout uh, steel plate. Uh, there was never really an announcement of Apple on that building. Uh, so it was only through uh, you know, careful some display. But anyway, it was, uh, I don't know if there was a rational thought. It was really like a daring move that if you create the icon object and as Foster and Partners are doing more recently, that it just is 
just too powerful of a draw to avoid. And of course, you know, when you get their um, the magic of their own products and you think, well, I got to have one and we're going to just find the nearest store you can get to. <laughs> yeah. Great. Next question. Uh, did you have any inspiration from the pyramid in front of the Louvre in Paris? Uh, well, it's interesting that that's um, an example that's often referenced. Um, I would say that object is quite larger than the cube. Uh, there are many of um, uh, the fabricators that built that uh, pyramid were also involved with the cube. Um, the challenge that we had was that the city of New York uh, building and zoning officials embraced this idea of the cube, but it was always in their mind that it need not, shouldn't have a Dom, uh, in appearance or size to um, compete too much with the tower in the beyond. So we actually started with something um, that was more like 40 feet in all sides and did a mock-up on site and eventually decided that we needed to reduce it. Um, so yeah, I mean the impact of the the pyramid to the uh, the grounds of the Louvre can't, could not be ignored, um, but we didn't certainly didn't want to you know replicate it. But we knew that or had a sense that again you create this unique object that that is so compelling that it will draw visitors and customers to it. Great, thanks. Have another one here. What was the most profound and memorable Steve Jobs design moment? Um, well, there, uh, Steve um, wanted and desired to be involved in every little detail. So the very early stores, as I said, we, the, we would meet with him weekly and he would like, he wanted to understand and we presented um, recommendations and options about how we would detail and lay out these um, stores. Um, I would say that, uh, as I pointed out in that sort of fixture, I think the, the assembly of these glass sheets were quite interesting to him. And so the character of these fittings, the quality of um, uh, the stainless steel was very um, important. And if you go into these stores, you'll notice the, uh, the, the ones that are remaining, <clears throat> the puck facings have a three prong um, face to it, and that's the ability to uh, torque down the fitting. But if you look at them, they're all perfectly arranged so that the triangle is always like this, created by the three prongs. So it's not only worth. <laughs> It not only were they crafted beautifully, but they were assembled quite beautifully. So this this is more of a comment, but back to your uh, back to your chart of the Apple share price and the history of products. It seems like shortly after the uh, Apple stores, the share price rocketed. Is that because of the architecture of the Apple stores? Well, partially. Part, uh, certainly. I think it was 
it was a bolt. It was actually an interesting move back in 20 years ago to create stores. <clears throat> and um, I think Steve and his team believed that in order for greater customer reach, uh, they had to do a medley of things, right? So they had some interesting commercials at the time. <laughs> Uh, again, their promotion of Think Different was out at that time. Um, but also the idea of creating these locations where people could uh, actually physically handle product um, in cases where um, Apple did not have a product themselves, how they would integrate with digital cameras and other devices, that you could actually do that in a very um, welcoming space with a lot of very knowledgeable uh, personnel that would help you um, navigate your way through you know, exploring and considering products. And then this famous genius bar, you know, rarely at the time could you get dedicated uh, technical service and then they had a collection of um, stores that had these theaters. So it was always about presenting how to make movies, how to make photo albums, how to make music on, using your digital devices. So I think the, the collection of all of those things um, just gave um, a lot of, um, impetus for the expansion of Apple as a company. So I have another question here. So is there is there a budget for these stores? I guess, how do you estimate um, this type of work? Well, I would say even at early days, um, they, they did have a budgetary overview, and um, but uh, the glass assemblies are expensive, admittedly, and so trying to um, make that in an affordable language was a challenge. Um, the very early stores, like the one in Soho, had. Um, Chipboard walls uh, did have interesting graphics, um, but for the most part had a little had more economical use of wall materials. They were, you know, high quality um, chipboard walls, but for the most part, the material palette was, you know, modest to elevated modest level. Well, as these stores got to um, be more and more successful, companies becoming more and more profitable, uh, material palette just kept expanding to include stainless steel walls and stone walls. Um, I would say it continues to expand. I mean, these latest things that um, Foster and partners are able to do. I don't think there's many other companies in the world that could pull off um, that kind of um, design and that kind of material richness. Um, so I hate to venture in terms of <laughs> you know their budget budget figures, cost figures. So was there a project that stood out? Could, I mean, could be an Apple store, or another project that was the most, most challenging from a research and development perspective? Uh, when you said product, you mean which store? Yeah, yeah, is there, is there, is there a single store that uh, was more challenging than the other ones? Um, I'm sure out of your experience, one might stand out potentially. Um, well, uh, I would say that the original cube um, 
So I got involved on these stores in uh, spring of 2001. I had reached out to um, James O'Callaghan to think about glass assemblies, um, you know, a few months after that. So the rigor of doing what we did in a Soho, um, you know, was fresh territory for me, and it may not have been that fresh for James, but it did require a fair amount of um, collaboration, mostly with uh, Sealy out of Germany and Tripyramid out of Boston. But to go from that, what I would consider relatively uh, humble <laughs> start <laughs> to doing something that has such uh, integration of everything that we learn in, uh, in five years from its opening date. Um, both in sheets of glass and assembly, um, curving glass, integrating an elevator inside it. The original store at Fifth Avenue was, was just like a huge leap of faith from a lot of us. Thankfully, it had a lot of <clears throat> history behind us of how to do this, but um, it was, uh, it was probably the most remarkable thing for me to watch as it, as it was unveiled uh, that late night before it opened. I just, I was not sure what it was gonna look like, um, but it was, a, <clears throat> it was truly a memorable moment to watch it. Um, all the protection material come down and this objects just start glowing in front of the tower. Okay. This next one is a little bit more of a comment than a question. And I don't think we have anybody from Foster and Partners on the call. I guess I could be wrong though. Um, but I guess the, the comment here is, while the new Foster and Partners retail stores are diverse examples of form, making and technological advancement of building they seem to lack the rigor and clarity of the tectonic expression found in BCJ designs. It's that expression that created a strong iconic image for Apple in the retail environment, and certainly more representative of Jobs' philosophy. So you don't necessarily need, need, need to comment on it. Just, just wanted to read that as, as a comment from one of our attendees here tonight. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that as a, you know, as a, um, you know, thought about pulling this presentation together. I um, mean, I acknowledge that first I had to acknowledge when and how Steve's involvement was part of this. And it's, you know, there's been a lot of work on these stores that have occurred since his passing. And they, they, start to show uh, influences of other leaders. I mean, like when Steve got, um, when Steve was no longer involved, um, Johnny Ives started to get more involved. And of course he was uh, led a lot of the uh, developments for Apple Park. Um, Angela Ahrens became the new retail senior VP um, and her background in retail was different than Ron Johnson's. And so those voices started to influence things. Uh, they, as they said, they were so integral with what was happening with Apple Park that um, uh, those, that language of uh, materials and emphasis of themes uh, started to change. But, um, you know, Steve, as you can imagine, you know, he started in a garage tinkering with early computers. He loved technology. And so these, um, I think a lot of 
the reason for doing these glass assemblies are largely of his enamoration with uh, the way things are put together and how to, how to express it. And um, yeah. So that's all the questions I have at the moment. Uh, now is everyone's last chance. If you would like to ask a question while we still have Carl on the call, uh, please do so on in the message box and we'll read it out loud or any type of comment. So Carl, we do have, uh, there's, there's a few people here with me in my conference room. Uh, we did recognize a few, oh, uh, here we go. There's a guy standing in front of it. We do, we do recognize a few of the products we saw tonight from, from this book. Yes. Were you, uh, this, this, is, this is BCJ's new book, I guess, released in the past two years or so. Were you involved in that at all? Yes, I was, I was involved uh, in the book. No. It was really led by um, Principal Ray Calibro, who had been involved in the, uh, the three monographs before. And um, through collaboration of all the principals um, and offices, uh, this was book was purposely conceived as um, with all public buildings. There's no residences in that building. And as you can tell by its title, uh, it was meant to sort of touch upon the way people get together, the way they work together and interact. And of course, this is pre-COVID days. Hopefully we'll be able to get back to such an important aspect of working in collaborative environments. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it was very, um, I think a very important time for the firm to start to acknowledge uh, this quite diverse kind of project types that um, all centered around the importance of getting together and interacting. Great. Yeah, it was a, it was, it was a sales pitch in no way. I just, I, I definitely recommend the book. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, we just, we just recognize quite a, quite a few products in there. Yeah. Um, so it looks like we got uh, a comment that was addressed to everyone. Actually, a, a, fun, a fun fact here. Uh, on this day, September 16th, 1985, I guess Steve Jobs quit Apple. And September 16th, 1997, he rejoins Apple. Not sure if it's true or not, but at, that's definitely a fun, a fun fact for the evening, if, that's, if it is true. <laughs> yeah. I'll be a fact check. It was on the internet. It was on the internet. <laughs> We, we can we can do a fact check just just might take a moment yeah it, yeah it's hard to, um, it's hard to actually quant to re i mean maybe apple does make recognize his date as a return but i know there was a period of time that he was involved um with apple as a consultant before officially returning as ceo so so maybe that date is his official CEO title. Yeah. 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 It's true. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, th thanks, Jeff. <laughs> okay. So this is this is the last opportunity at, to ask Carl call a question or a comment. We don't have anything else. Uh, Carl, I'd like to like to thank you for presenting. Definitely a neat neat body of work. Definitely interesting to hear uh, hear your story. Um, just wait a second here to see if any more questions come through. But um, once again, um, this presentation tonight is worth one AI learning unit. So we do have your AI numbers from registration. Um, if you like a certificate and have not already, please message your first and last name in the chat box. And any any closing words, Carl? If there's no no more questions, or well, I, I do want to <clears throat> um, say I mean I made 
several acknowledgements at the beginning. I do want to acknowledge and thank um, many of the people that I work with at Pixar and Apple. So, uh, you know, a great deal of appreciation goes to Steve Jobs himself, to Tom Carlisle and Craig Payne of Pixar at Apple, Ron Johnson, great leader, uh, Bob Bridger, John Hillegas, Ben Fay, BJ Siegel, uh, Pat O'Brien, Chris Morris. These are all people that help make this um, retail development program work, not just with me, but with many other, other design professionals. So uh, a lot of um, thanks and uh, credit should be given to those individuals. So. So thank you, Jared, and thank you, Joe, for uh, giving me this gracious opportunity to uh, share a story. <laughs>